Can you believe we've actually done 30 episodes of Fireside Chat? This week, we discuss the Lane McDermott trade. We talk about trade rumors with Mikael Backlund and how valuable Chris Russell is to the team. Our listener feedback has us discussing the AHL team's success, shootouts, comparing Eric Nystrom and Tom Kostopoulos, and a whole lot more. This is Fireside Chat, episode 30, recorded November 25th, 2013. Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. We're back for another episode of the podcast after a week where the Flames took five of six points. And before we get started, I want to wish both of you guys a happy 30th anniversary. This is Dan with Matt and Luke. How are you guys doing? 30 years. Where has the time gone? 30 episodes. I can't believe we're on our 30th already. The show's not even a year old either because we started last year after the lockout. This time last year, there was no NHL hockey. Ah, yes. But let's not relive that because that was... That was a bad time for all of us. It was. It was. Well, I think, you know, we can look on a more positive note and talk about the Flames in this past week. On last week's episode, we really talked about how the Flames seem to have been losing their step and seem to have been um, not following through with the great start they had to the season. And then they came out this past week and proved us wrong, getting five of possible six points. They got a, they got a win over Winnipeg. They got an overtime... Was it a shootout or an overtime? It was a loss in overtime. Oh, right. A loss in overtime to the Blue Jackets and then a win against Matt's other favorite team, the Florida Panthers. Matt, what do you think of that? What do you think of that Panthers uh, game? Well, when both teams are as good as the Florida Panthers and Calgary Flames are, there's only so much you can do. You know, I actually wore my Panthers jersey, broke it out for only the second time, I think. So, that was different, but, yeah. It was an interesting game, for sure. Luke, what do you think? I, I thought, uh, I thought Tim Thomas looked done. He, uh, yeah, that, that, uh... Yeah, I was at the game, and I agree with you. I was watching him, and I thought, he got really lucky. There were a lot of flame shots that weren't hitting the net, or weren't very accurate or very hard, and I think Thomas came out of that game looking a lot better than he deserved to. Well, and he looked like a goof. He, like, smashing your stick like that in the shootout, like, show some composure, man. Yeah, and he was starting to look like a 41-year-old goalie. Uh, and realistically, he's only going to be on Florida's team until the trade deadline. Because there's somebody that'll need, you know, at least a stopgap for, you know, like, say, like, Pittsburgh with their goaltending issues. They might like to have somebody that might be able to step up in case Flurry falters during the playoffs. That would be terrific on so many levels. Tim Thomas in Pittsburgh is has the potential to be better than Brzgalov in Philly. Well, I was going to say, if you're a GM and you need to pick up a guy like that at the uh, deadline, I would almost look at picking up Brzgalov over Tim Thomas. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Brzgalov's probably still a better goalie. Um, he's better, he's younger, and... He's probably a guy who the Oilers can make look half decent this year in net. I think the Oilers still hope that he can take them to the playoffs, and they're with. And if they're within any, like, I'd say even like eight points of the playoffs by the deadline, they owe it to their fans to try and you know win with that group a little bit. Yeah, but what do you think the chances they're going to be within eight points of the playoffs? It's possible, aren't they playing well right now? Well, they're down to nothing to Chicago tonight. Fair enough. Although I, I and I understand the West is really good. They keep talking about like the last place team, or sorry, the uh, eighth place team in the Western Conference would be like first in the East or something. Um, maybe that's not true. Mm-hmm. But it is. You know. Oh God. Well, then in that case, yeah, they're probably not going to be within reach. 
Overall, do you guys think the Flames look good this week, or did they just have some weak opponents? I think they just had weak opponents. Like, each of Columbus, Florida, and Winnipeg are... Well, at the time, Columbus and Florida were below us in the standings, and Winnipeg was only a couple points ahead of us. So, you know, they're... It's a lot easier to get wins if you're facing equivalent teams especially with our work ethic but you know if the flames go up against teams that have more depth of talent i don't think they'd have gotten five out of six points no i watched the uh blue jackets game twice i watched it live and then i kind of watched it again on pvr and double the speed I didn't think the Flames looked all that good. I mean, I think they got lucky in a lot of places. I think that they still looked like a bottom team. And I just think it was a weak opponent that they were on the ice with that they managed to even get to overtime against. I was surprised that they managed to uh, take the game to overtime. I was impressed that the people I'm looking to be impressed by, namely the kids, played well. And honestly, after that, I don't really care about the results yeah as long as the kids play good it's good yeah speaking of kids playing well blair jones got called back up for his first uh shot at the pro roster this year and i thought that of all the things that weren't good in the panthers game blair jones is one of the things that looked pretty good for this team. yeah most definitely you guys have thoughts on his first uh his first start i thought he looked you know, stepped in and didn't look out of place. He did score. And overall, you know, like, he, if you're expecting him to come in and be a top six-ish forward, you know, it, that's probably unrealistic. But, you know, if he can fill in adequately in the third or fourth line role, that would be good. Well, really, he's filling Jackman's roster spot. And well, he's Jackman, Jackman has played on the second line recently, so <laughs> that's <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, it, <laughs> I th- I think that that's a message. It's proving what the Flames said they were going to do at the beginning of the year, which is if you play well, you're going to get rewarded. And Jones has been playing really well in the AHL so far, and now they're rewarding him for it. Who knows how long he'll stay here, but at least he's getting a shot to show that he proves to play at this level. So I'm glad to see them following through with that. Oh, most definitely. Do you guys think that he'll stay here for the rest of the season, or do you think they're going to rotate that spot among various different guys in the farm? I think he will not stay here unless he makes it impossible for them to send him down. And it remains to be... So you think it's his job to lose? I think any time you're sent up, it is your job to lose. If If... You know, if one of these call-ups comes up and scores two goals in the first game, then, of course, they stay up for another game. Then, if they keep producing, then, obviously, they, you know, they make it impossible, much like Monaghan did. That's that's what the meritocracy is. Or even uh, Rito Barra yeah. called up and made it impossible to send him Basically, down. Basically, yes. Yeah, and, you know, if you look at who the Flames have on the farm, I think there's a lot of guys that they'd probably like to try out in that role. I think that they probably want to bring Corbin Knight up. They probably want to see what they have in Lane McDermott. Um, So I think that we will see that role or other roles in the team. Maybe Gratz gets scratched and somebody else gets brought up, but I think that we will see um, a revolving door of farm players, which we all expected this year on the bottom six. Also... Like coming up soon, the trade deadline, well, the Olympic break is coming up, and you're likely going to see three or four or five guys, you know, the veteran guys leaving. So that's going to open up spots for guys like Knight, McDermott, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, for the time being, you see what Jones has, because I think he had like 19 points already this year, and the AHL or something like that. So you, you know, see what he's got and who knows. But, yeah. If... You know, and I have to give Blair Jones credit based on everything that I've seen. He got cut. He was the Flames' last cut in the, uh, in the, in the, um, training camp and he went down to the HL and he didn't sulk and he didn't, you know, Oh, I shouldn't be here. All that sort of thing. He 
went down there and he made it so that they had to bring him back up. I mean, he made it so that they had no choice. He has, uh, he's played a heck of a year in Abbotsford. He's been a leader from everything that I hear and see. So I think that's great when you got guys that can say, yeah, I understand that this is my role, but I'm going to play hard to earn that NHL spot back. He's, yeah, he's been undeniable in Abbotsford, so now he's here. So if he can continue to be undeniable, then he should stay. Good luck to you, Blair. Well, guys, I thought we'd start with some of our listener feedback. Uh, over the last two weeks, we've been asking some listeners to send us some email, give us some feedback, and let us know what they think of the Flames, the show, that sort of thing. I um, thought I'd share an email we got a couple weeks ago here from a fellow named Brian. And Brian pretty much sent us an email saying, uh, Guys, love the show. Me and my son are diehard Flames fans, and we save every episode to listen to in the car on the way to my son's hockey games. So I thought that was pretty cool that we're part of his son and his, I guess, his father's son uh, bonding time going to hockey. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you for listening, Brian. We appreciate it. So thanks to Brian and his son, and we hope that his son's team has a more successful year than the Flames probably will this year. (laughs) Yeah. And thank you to all our listeners as well. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, thanks to everyone that listens. We wouldn't be doing this without you guys. We wouldn't be here, um, you know, producing this show weekly if people weren't listening, if people weren't giving us feedback. So thanks to each and every one of you who have been giving us feedback. And we'll read some more feedback and comments throughout the episode. Yeah. Speaking of call-ups and uh, new faces on the team... Let's talk about the new face within the Flames organization and the change that happened. I think we could essentially say this trade was a trade that was Jackman for Lane McDermott. I mean, we traded Jackman to Anaheim for a sixth-round pick and then flipped a sixth-round pick to uh, Dallas for Lane McDermott. And uh, Lane McDermott is, I think everyone agrees, pretty much the same player as Jackman, but a lot younger. He's 24. He shoots left. He's a left winger. And he's had, I think, 28 games at the NHL level. So he's got some taste of the NHL. Um, Any thoughts on this trade? Anybody know anything about Lane Um, McDermott? When he was still in juniors, I watched a bit of him. And the most direct comparable for Flames fans would be basically a slightly more physical Lance Boma. You know, each of them is more or less going to be a fourth liner. And, you know, McDermott can fight probably better than Boma. I've only seen a couple of his fights. So, you know, anytime you can get a six foot three fourth liner that can skate well, play decent defensively, and can fight re- rather well, you know, it. It's always good, and the fact that he's only 24 allows him to grow with the core that's coming in, the Bear Cheese, the Monahans, and that. So, it's all good. Yeah, I mean, a young Tim Jackman, who was a hungry, motivated player, was a terror to play against. Um, and if we get someone like that for relatively the same broken down... The cost of the broken down version gets you the new model... Um, go, good trade, good trade. It's a very Burke sort of move. Yeah, well, I was kind of surprised because when we traded Jackman, I thought, okay, you know, Flames were cutting their losses. I understood that trade. I think Anaheim's done us a similar favor in the past when they took Hagman off our hands for a low round pick. Um, and then to see them turn around and flip a sixth for a 24 year old guy who has some NHL experience, I thought, wow, that's either a so we got a good scouting eye. This is either a good pickup. Or this guy's going to be a career AHLer. But either way, we do need some toughness in the AHL as well. And that's where McDermott's going to be playing for the time being. he's actually a good enough player where he could, like on a rebuilding team like Calgary, he could slot in in the fourth line and he wouldn't be out of place. So, you know, I'm kind of expecting him in the next round of call-ups to be one of the guys that does get the call. And, you know, you need... Like having McGratton play every game, you need guys out there to keep the other team in line because you don't need Berchi getting concussed again or Monahan getting targeted. So, you know, it's all good. And if you can get the nucleus of the team being all roughly the same age, 
then they'll be growing together as a team. And that's very important for future success. Yeah, I think it, it's a good thing to have some tough guys. But I think the fact you said he's like Lance Boma, who I think Lance Boma is a decent hockey player. I think that's promising because it shows us that um, we've got a guy who can work with the puck, who can handle the puck, who can you know slot in as more than just a tough guy, which I think we'd all argue is probably all McGrath yeah. can do. It, he's basically he's like the hybrid of the two, uh, between Boma and McGrath. Like he can fight more like McGrath can, but he's got some game to him. So, yeah. Sounds like a worthwhile yeah. trade. And realistically, we did lose like 20 spots or so in the draft, but in the sixth round, it doesn't matter. I think in the sixth round, pretty much everybody's the same, whether you have the first pick or the last yeah. pick. Well, I don't think you're going to get that much yeah. better. It, like, about 1% turn into anything worthwhile anyway. Yeah, I have a funny feeling the Flames will acquire a, another pick in a higher round that might make yeah. up for that. Well, we do have quite a lot of players down that the road. could get traded. So, it shouldn't be hard to get another sixth. No, not at all. We do have no reason to hold that? out for this core to pull it together, right? And I don't think anyone can say, oh, that was a waste of a sixth. Like, it's not like we're probably going to get a better player through draft that we would see in the organization making an impact anywhere in the next couple of years. Well, haven't you seen the internet, Dan? Of course people can complain about us losing a sixth. They can complain about whatever they want, but I guess we will see what ends up happening with that sixth pick. I don't think it would amount yeah. to much. Well, you know, I'm sure it's going to be we, the next Mark Edward Vlasic. We lost Vlasic. a couple of fourths and a fifth, you know, so people are freaking out instead of, <laughs> you know, because why are you treating picks? <laughs> Never mind that we're getting useful players like Colborn and Russell. and. We, we just have to wait. I think everyone knows that we're going to have to just wait and see what happens. Um... I trust this organization, I trust the guys in charge of it, and I think that if they're trading picks, it's because they know what they're doing. We're going to get them back. Um, th this is a bit of a change of pace, because uh, you mentioned uh, getting something back of value being Chris Russell. Um, Chris Russell, I believe, is only on a one-year deal, right? Mm-hmm. He's UFA at the end of the year. Yeah, he should probably be traded at the deadline, wouldn't you think? Like... I'd try to sign well, him. I understand why you'd want to, but, I mean, here's the thing. Is is Chris Russell part of the core of this team going forward? Probably not. Like, I'm sure Chris Russell is a very replaceable piece, and if you can get some... Well, when you say core of this team going forward, how far in the future are you looking? I would say even two years from now. Like... The thing is, is that you have two very similar defensemen between him and Weidman, right? They're both got mm -hmm. good shots. They're both po power play quarterback types. You're likely going to get more of a return for Weidman, you know, because he has more of a track record of success. So, you know, if you're going to deal one of them, why not get somebody, get rid of the one that you're going to get the most back from? Yeah, like if... If, you know, like, if you can sign Russell for, like, the same duration that Weidman has, but for, like, say, two and a half per instead of 5.25, and you can get more for him, why not? Yeah, I just I just don't know that they're... Russell's making 1.5 right now. I think I'd probably re-sign him to a one or two year. You're right, he not, might not be part of a long-term plan, but I think that he serves a purpose on this team in the next couple of years. Yeah, I suppose. I guess I just see him as sort of like a five on a fringe playoff team sort of thing. So oh, I, yeah. I don't necessarily think that... So, so I mean, he's a, a good stopgap player, I suppose, but I would see if someone who's going to make a postseason or who needs like an extra offensive D uh, would give us something for him. Because I do think, he, as good as he's played, I really like what he's done. Um, I think he's replaceable. Yeah, I think if the right, if the right deal comes along at the deadline, I definitely trade him. But if it comes down to UFA, roughly the same price, take him or leave him, I think I'd take him in that scenario. I suppose I would just think that anyone we could get through free agency would hopefully be a bit bigger. 
You just want to get rid of all the defensemen. You're, you want to get rid of Butler. You want to get rid of Russell. I don't want to, I, no, I'm not saying I don't want. I don't like Russell on the team. I'm just saying that in terms of maximizing value, like it, it, it's silly to get too attached to these, you know, scrappy bit player, role player type guys, because like. <laughs> That they can come later, I suppose. I guess the... I understand what you're saying, and I think part of being in a rebuild is knowing how to manage assets. And if we can sign an asset for say a million five, million eight, and it's an asset people would want, should we not try to re-sign him, knowing that if he doesn't work out here, at least we can flip him for something? I mean, it's almost like making an investment, a long-term investment. Well, well but people rarely do that sign and trade thing. It seems like... Well, not sign trade, but sign him, put him through training camp. If he doesn't make it, trade him then. Well, but then you'd be dealing from a position of weakness. The point of trading him at the deadline this year would be he's been playing really, really well. Some team might say, give you know, really freak out and give us a, a second or, you know, probably a third. But, all the, you know, you're buying draft picks basically through your Russell acquisition, and that's what you need. You need more picks in the top 90. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. If a good deal comes to the deadline, I'd take it. But at, when it comes July 1st, we're not going to have that kind of a deal on the table. So if he's still here after the deadline, I think I'd bring him back. Well, if he's still here by the deadline and you let him go, you were irresponsible. Um, he has to be signed by the deadline or he needs to go. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that what uh, with Russell, like what I would do is just keep him for a while like as we're starting to emerge through the rebuild because he's gonna be getting more of an opportunity because our defense isn't exceptional so Mm -hmm. like down the road like a year or so from now you might be able to like trade a middling forward like say Backlund and Russell for somebody that's actually better like, you know, yeah, it, it's one of those things that anybody that's over the age of 23, you can't really count on them being here for, like, another two years, even. <laughs> so, like, everybody's... But at the same time, we can't switch everybody over the age of 23 every year. We have to have some consistency. If the point of the Chris Russell playing above his head means that he's going to generate more value. But I don't know that he's going to be worth more in a year as, he, is, as opposed to what he is right now. And es- essentially then say, okay, you re-sign him to a one, another one-year, $2 million deal, and then you trade him at the deadline next year for a second or third round pick. You probably could have got that second or third round pick here, except you just paid twice as much in terms of actual money f- for the draft pick. And... A player like Russell is replaceable, and he's, you know, I'm sure most of the NHL views him as a nice player, but a dime a dozen sort of player. So you have to sort of strike while the iron is hot in these guys. They're they're not going to just become exceptionally higher-valued commodities, I would imagine. Yeah, I, I can see both sides of it. I just think we need some, and again, if we get a great deal for him at the deadline, I think, yeah, he's got to go. But if we're not getting an exceptional deal, I wouldn't move him just to move him to get something. I'm okay with him being around here for the next, um, you know, two, three years to help transition us through this period. Because I think he's a... Yeah. Well, the thing is also that we don't really have any defensive prospects that are imminently challenging for his spot. Like, we have Sealoff, who likely will be in the NHL next year. But even Watherspoon's just okay, and like all the other guys, like they're just okay. It's not like the forward group where you have like nine or ten guys that could feasibly be in the NHL in the next year. So, you know. Breen's probably the closest. Yeah, and really he's a six, so. Eh. You know, like there's just not that same level of urgency to you know, switch things up. Well, Luke, I guess we'll we'll see how this one shakes out. I can see both sides. I'm okay either way, but I think that he's a guy that if we can't trade him, I'd extend the contract because I think he's earned a contract extension. I, I, okay, I, I, I do agree with you, though. I 
flip it around that if we can't sign him, he should be traded. Um, there's no way a team in our position should be carrying an expiring contract like Chris Russell, who is a useful player, uh, past the deadline. He's got to be gone for whatever we can get if he's if it's clear he's not going to sign by the deadline. Okay, that makes that makes sense to me. Yeah, so sign him or trade him is pretty much what you're saying. If we can sign him, keep him around. Yeah. If we can't, dump him for exactly. an asset. Yeah, and plus the Flames management would be conversing with him, so they would know exactly what his intentions are well ahead of time anyway. Another question that we got this week, and this one was pretty odd. Um, a guy named Jerry set up a Twitter account, asked us a question, and then deleted his Twitter account. So we couldn't even get back to him through Twitter or thank him for following us. So, Jerry, whoever you are, um, thanks for asking us a question. You could have emailed us. You could have called us on Skype, whatever's easiest. But sorry, Twitter's not for you. And Jerry asked us, how do you think the Flames have looked in two shootouts in the last week? Um, this is a team that's historically not done well in shootouts. Matt, what do you think? How, how do you think the Flames well, will look? It's one of those things that you get new personnel in, you can't rely on Alex Tangay and Jerome McGinley to go out there and be two of your three shooters, so you have to try new things. And, you know, Joe Colborn's looked good. Monaghan, of course, with two game winners. You know, it's good. And,. You need to get more players that can actually win in the shootout. Like, I know the Flames are, like, one of the... Have you been surprised by who the Flames have chosen to shoot? Eh, not really. Like, I, the only one that was a little weird was having Blair Jones shoot, but, you know, they, they were trying to reward him for a good game. So I can kind of understand that. So do you think that some of the flame shootout woes in the past were more the skaters who were shooting, or do you think it was the goalie who didn't do well in shootouts? Well, Kipper was never exceptional in shootouts, but our shooters were kind of terrible at the whole shootout game. Usually uh, the best shootout players are the younger players, for whatever reason that is. And so... You know, I guess they do a little bit more fancy stick work in practice. I don't know. But, um, like, I know in the farm team, uh, Marcus Granlund is apparently exceptional in the shootout. So, yeah, like, we have more guys that are coming up that have that dynamic ability. And, like, I know the Flames don't participate in the shootouts often. I think we have the third fewest. But, you know, it it's good to have more players so we can act that are good so that way we might actually win more than like three a year <laughs> yeah and the more guys you have that can um win shootouts i think the better off you're going to be even though you know shootouts don't happen a lot i think that any guy who can win a shootout is probably showing that he's also a good shooter and you know that's an important that's an important thing to have on any team is guys that are good shooters even if they're lower on in your um, lower down in your depth chart like you know bottom six guys that sort of thing but guys who maybe okay maybe they're not good shooters but they have confidence they have that confidence to go in and beat the goalie one on one yeah like Joel Colborn for example like he you know he's not gonna score thirty goals but. You know, if he can win you a game by scoring a couple goals in a shootout, like, over the course of a year, well, that's good. You know, and realistically, the difference between being in the playoffs and not being in the playoffs is usually only a couple of points. So, over the course of a year, if you're winning a couple extra shootouts, that can make the difference. It, you know, it all depends, but, it, you know, it's always better to win than not win. Yeah, and I think even when we're um, not winning, I think that the the team is looking more confident in shootouts this year. I feel like guys are trying things, um, trying different types of shots, and I don't know, it just looks like there's more effort being put into it, which, you know, effort at anything is yeah, a good idea. Yeah, most definitely. Always gonna help <laughs> most definitely. Out. Well, guys, I thought we'd uh, shift the focus a little bit away from... Um, our defensemen and trading and talk a little bit more about a guy that maybe we could get something for. And that is Mikael Backlund. And a lot of people have been talking about, maybe we should move him, Um, if he's even on the block. 
And on TSN earlier, I guess late last week, uh, Drager reported that Backlund is on the block and teams have been talking to the Flames about him. He looked good this past week to me. Um, would you guys move him if if teams were calling the Flames? Would the, do you think the Flames should be listening to those deals? What do you think it would take to move Backlund? What would you want to see as a comparable return? Me personally, I wouldn't like to trade Backlund because I think he's got enough there where he could be a very good defensively reliable winger on the third or fourth line at the very worst. But, you know, like, we do have Gaudreau, uh, Jankowski, Poirier, Knight. Klimchuk, Monahan, Berchi, on and on and on and on. And, you know, Knight, Colborne, all competing with them. And, like, our first round pick this year is likely going to be a forward unless we get Ekblad. So, you know, if... The Flames can trade Backlund for an equivalently talented defenseman. Like, I know, like, Michael Delzato's been mentioned as being available from the Rangers. If you can get somebody like that in a trade with other pieces, of course, involved to balance it out, sure, I wouldn't like it personally because I, I do like Backlund. I think he is a good, at least, third-line player, but we do have a glut of about 15 or so really good forward prospects that all look like they might have the potential to be NHLers, and we only have 12 roster spots. So, you know, and, like, on defense, we only have Seeloff and, you know, a bunch of question marks beyond that. So if we can trade an asset for an area of weakness... That might be okay. So, you, so you'd you'd want to get if we're gonna trade him, you'd want to get an NHL quality defenseman back. Yeah, most definitely. I would not trade him for picks. I would not trade him for veteran forwards. Nothing. Only defensemen of an equivalent age and potential. That's it. I, I'd agree with Matt. I don't think you'll lose much by keeping Backlund, but I do think if you can get something of value like a young defenseman who's maybe fallen out of favor with another team, then. Go ahead, do it. I don't think anyone's married to Michael Backlund. I think they're... They hope for the best for the guy, but I don't think anyone... I think the days of us counting on him to be one of our franchise saviors are past. Yeah, and maybe that's why there's so much talk about him moving and people want to trade him, because they're still thinking he's going to be that franchise player. I think he's a good NHLer. I think he's going to have a career in the NHL. Um... I don't see him being a career-long flame. I think at some point he's going to move out of here, whether by trade or through UFA. But, yeah, to me, I'd keep him. I mean, if there's no good offer on the table, I wouldn't just move him just to move him at this point, move him because he needs to change his scene or anything like that. And, yeah, if they can get a good defenseman back, I think you have to bring a young NHL roster player back. I wouldn't move him for picks or for veteran guys or the future or anything like that. But to me, you know, listen to the offers that come by and see if it's worth it. And if a good deal comes, take it. But I wouldn't be in any hurry to move them out if it was me. We got uh, another message here uh, through Facebook. And the question is, um, Bargy's been scoring lately. Do you think Friday's power play goal will, goal will finally get him going? Well, thus far, berchi has been somewhat of an inconsistent forward. And... Like, when he actually does break through the ice, you see him go on a little bit of a tear. So I wouldn't be entirely surprised if, like, over the next week or two, like, he gets three or four more goals, you know, in short order. It, you know, like, at the end of last season, I think he had, like, points in eight or nine straight games. So, yeah, I could see him doing something like that again. But you don't think this is going to ignite him to take off and you know really explode this season you think it'll just still be a short term he'll do well for a couple games and he'll go back to doing what he's been doing. well thus far in his nhl career he's looked a lot like how yuri hoodler was with detroit in that like he'd come on and like you think he's finally turning the corner and then he'd disappear for 20 games and then he'd turn on again and you'd think oh Maybe it's this time, and then no. And, like, at the end of the year, he'll have 40, 50 points, but, 
you don't see it consistently throughout. And, like, that's the frustrating part, and that's why you're seeing him getting benched in that. Because they're wanting to see him do this on a night-to-night -night basis instead of in intermittent. If he can figure out the consistency, he should be good to go, like, as a key contributor. But, like, even Hoodler's slowed down a bit recently, so just one of those things. Well, I think, too, when you're saying Hoodler slow down, I think it's hard to keep the pace up when the rest of the team isn't keeping pace. With oh, no, yet. of course not. But, you know, it's kind of emblematic of what we've been seeing of Berchi, where, you know, gangbusters for short spurts and then disappearing for the rest. Yeah, and that's, you know, as we've said before, that's something that these guys need to work on, and that's why, you know, they're here for a rebuild. Yeah. And it takes time, and, after, you know, you, you just don't know what you have until they prove what they are. You know, it, it, he's skilled, but you don't know. So, guys, a um, couple more things. I thought we'd shift focus away from the NHL team and move to the AHL team. And I have to, I really enjoy this story because for years people have said that our cupboards are bare in Calgary. The Flames have no good prospects, yet the Abbotsford Heat are the number one team in the AHL. Do you guys think it's because the Flames do indeed have a good prospect pool? Do you think it's because Troy Ward's getting the best out of these kids? Or are they just having a good start I and they're going to fizzle? I think it's because the Flames have so many good young forwards in their system. Like, they don't have any upper upper end talent beyond guys like Monaghan and Goodrow but like your quality second line third line and fourth line players they seem to have them in spades right now so you know like that's extending like all the way through Abbotsford's whole lineup of quality players on each of their lines as well so you know it's encouraging to see it's exciting I suppose it, it validates the last uh couple drafts and Feaster's attempts to rebuild the farm system. I think it's fair to say that he really learned from his drafting habits in Tampa and took a different approach, and the scouting and drafting looks to have been doing an admirable job. Um, and yes, they still haven't proven much at the NHL level, but the fact that our AHL teams have been very bad over the last eight years... Uh, Speak and the fact that now they're not that speaks to some sort of influx of quality. So, good for them and good for Ordeo. Based on the prospect camp, I did not think he had this level in him. I think that it might be a bit different this year because I think everyone might be playing to a different level. In the past, they knew there really weren't a lot of roster spots open. So, I think that probably motivates people into thinking, you know what, why um, play that hard to try and prove something when there's nowhere to go and I think this year with a bunch of roster spots open and the management saying that if you play well on the farm you'll get rewarded seeing that with guys like Blair Jones coming up I think that's probably going to change the motivation to make these guys play perhaps harder than they would have in the past knowing there's nowhere to go up see I, I think that's actually a terrible cop out uh, our guys in the past didn't get chances because they weren't very good um, nobody in sports, nobody holds you back. You're either good enough to play in the show or you're not. And there may have been guys who could have been the same or a little bit worse than current vets on the team, but there was never a player we had in Abbotsford where we were like, oh, well, he should obviously be up when he wasn't. The, like, when David Moss deserved to be here, he was a full-time NHLer. Um, everyone who is here on some level or another does deserve to be here um and if it was a situation in the past where guys thought um there's nowhere for me to go up on the big club so why, i'm not going to try as hard then honestly they were weak and that's why they're not in the nhl or in the ahl anymore because they lacked the mental strength to do what was necessary well, also, if you're looking at the top 10 scores in the AHL for the Heat, you have only Blair Jones, Ben Street, Paul Byron, and Max Reinhardt that were 
there last year or have been in the organization for long. You have Chad Billens, Corbin Knight, uh, Mike, Marcus Granlin, Ben Hanowski, and Michael Furland that all are like first year AHL players on Abbotsford. So like you're getting that much more quality all at once instead of you know only having like three guys that are any good because depth is what matters and like we actually seem to have it now and you know i think there's been a a bigger like the names the matches list off there's been a bigger emphasis on the farm it seems like the flames have been making trades lately that they don't normally to just secure farm depth you know i mean guys like um uh, when he came up, I have a feeling that Joel Colborn might have been hired for that role. But guys like you know Paul Byron, uh, Corbin Knight, guys that are brought in, I think, thinking these guys are going to be farm players. Mark Kandari, and I think that's something that's important if you want a vibrant farm team. I know that coaches and GMs have a different thought on this, but do you guys think it's important for an AHL team to win and make the playoffs and see success really, at the AHL level? Because if you're good... You're not going to be there for long. You know what I mean? Like, if you have enough that you have to work on that you're there for a year or two or three, like, you're usually not going to be an impact player. Because, you know, like, you see guys like Berchi and that, like, they go straight in to the NHL. And even Backlund was, you know, not in the AHL long. So I don't really think that matters as much, but it's always a good thing to have. Yeah, I think that, and I, you know, I've never played at that level, I've never coached at that level, but I think that having a winning attitude can't hurt anything. I mean, I think if you have a team, I wouldn't go out and stock it up with vets just to win, but I think if you treat the team as though they should be winning and you, you know, encourage winning to happen, um, I think that it's a good mentality to say, let's get this team all the way to the Keller Cup. Let's make a run for it. Let's perhaps do what's needed, even if it is bringing in some vets later in the season who maybe aren't taking the spot of top guys, but are taking some of those depth uh, roles to help with that and to show these guys some success. I know that none of us are big AHL guys. Um, we did, however, get a uh, email from a listener about the AHL. Um, I'll read it off here. This comes from Tyler, um, and it says, Congratulations on your 30th show. I've enjoyed the podcast since it started. I'm generally enjoying watching the Flames this year as long as they show up to work. Best case scenario for the rebuild, two more full seasons, and Calgary can make the playoffs. That's assuming the organization keeps moving in the right direction, the prospects develop according to plan, and other teams in the conference start showing their age and trend downwards, such as the Ducks, Canucks, Kings, and Sharks. Um, I've noticed some people are wondering if audio success at the AHL indicates you'll get a call up with the big club sometime this season. But with the Heat playing as well as they are, and the Flames not even giving Ramo that much time in net, I wonder if it's best to have audio backstop a very successful AHL team this season. Curious to your thoughts of how the Heat's success as a team, potentially making a calendar a Calder run, relates to the Flames this season and maybe even next year. So yeah, I agree with him about Ordeo. I don't think I'd bring him up. I think we have our young goalie who we want to ride this one through with, and Ordeo needs to be in the AHL to uh, develop properly right now. Yeah, ice time is the most important thing. Yeah, the more ice time he can get at any major level, the better he's going to do. Yeah, unless it's a situation where you're going to come and start Ordeo in seven of eight games or something, just let him stay in the NHL. If there's an injury to someone i guess you have to bring him up but i was thinking about tyler's email and i the only way i thought maybe i'd bring him up is yeah if there's an injury if um barra gets hurt would you start ramo or would you bring audio up and start him while barra's out i'd say it's a couple weeks just because ramo doesn't seem to have the upside yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I'd probably at least bring Ordeo up for a look. I can't guarantee that I'd start him the whole time, but bring him up with the intention of starting him, give him a look, and see what happens. And Maybe he's not the guy that we need. Maybe he cracks under NHL pressure. Who knows? But I think I'd at least give him that look. Yeah, Ramo, I could, I could see him being a good backup in the league, but I don't see him being 
a starter. And frankly, I don't know if he'd stick around to be a backup. He might just go back and make starter money in the KHL. Yeah, very well could. I mean, he's making a lot of money to be a backup, and I think that for us to move that contract as a backup is going to be a tough thing for the Flames to do. So it's probably best if the Flames try to get him to leave on his own accord. No, I'm not saying he forces himself out, but I'm just saying that... I mean, we're in a situation where it doesn't matter that our backup makes $2.75 because the starter only makes, what, seven hundred and fifty grand or something? Barrett can't be making that much. No, I think he's making about 700000 Yeah, it doesn't yeah, really so, matter. You know, and Rommel's contract's done yeah, next year. For the, for the price of... So, what's the long-term problem? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess if we can keep him around as a backup, why not? It's probably better to have Ramo as a backup than bring Ordeo up and have him split games with uh, Barra. Yeah. Bring the guy up to to be your number one or whatever. And, you know, to me, I think there's a problem that a lot of teams would envy, and I know as a Flames fan, it's and I've hoped we'd have a problem for, for a long time, is we have so many goalies, we don't know what to do with them. So many good goalies. So I'm happy that we're finally in this spot. We hope we've got so many good goalies. I mean, keep in mind, we had one of the best goalies for 10 years, so it does sort of take away the uh, the uncertainty of the of the position. But That's true. Yep. But I... there's, there's a bunch of goalies that might be good. And to this point, eh, there's only well, I think one I think that looks like... it depends what we define good, too. I don't know who if we would ride these goalies through a playoff series or through a cup run. But I think there's goalies that'll be good enough to see us through this rebuild. Well, no, but isn't that the point, though? If you don't see them as good enough to lead you on a playoff run, they're not the guy, and you should probably seek another alternative, if possible. Uh, yeah, there's there's that. I think we might have some guys who maybe we keep with the organization, but not as a starter. Maybe Barra, we say, you know what, he's good, but we have the chance in a couple of years to get somebody better who might start, and Barra becomes the backup. Yeah, like a Gillies barra tandem would look really good. Hell, you, you, know, you know what would look really good? A uh, Hiller-Barra tandem. Like, Jonas Hiller should probably be a flame next year if Anaheim lets him walk. So you want our goaltending to be exclusively Swiss cheese? If it works, why not, right? Well... But it, it's just that Hiller is the best available goalie that you could possibly bring in. It's not a Brisgalov situation where he's a crazy person. Um, he's just a very good goalie. He's had some injury issues, but, you know, you need someone to sort of trans uh, be in place for sort of the, the transfer of power um, between, well, Kiprasov to, say, Gillies or whoever we end up drafting. And maybe... In a situ- it becomes a situation in, you know, three or four years where Gillies forces out, um, forces out Hiller. We got another email here from Josh, and Josh is uh, talking about you and I, Matt. He says that a couple weeks ago you guys compared Max Reinhardt to Kostopoulos. Why would you do that? At least Reinhardt is useful offensively. More of an Eric Nystrom player, perhaps. So you actually were mentioning before we came on the air tonight that he might not know this, but Kostopoulos actually has better offensive numbers in his career in the NHL than Nystrom does. Yeah, it, well, over a five-year span, Kostopoulos had 22 or 21 points in each season, where Nystrom's career high was, is 21, but he only did that once and has been a min, mid-teens point producer for the rest of his career. In either case, you know, like, I can understand what he's saying, because, like, Reinhardt is producing well in Abbotsford, but it, you know, with a player like that, it is very hard for them to break into the, a top nine spot. And, you know, usually you need to have a very good shot or good offensive instincts in order to be a 25, 30 point guy. Like, I don't even think guys that have higher end skill like uh, Joel Colborn and Corbin Knight have like 35, 40 point potential. Like, 
you know, in the, unless they're getting, like, second line ice time at points. So... And, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe Josh is comparing um, his limited view as a Flames fan of the time that these guys wore Flaming C. And I'd have to pull up the numbers here, but... Um, I can see where he might be coming from from that respect. That, yeah, maybe Nystrom did look more impressive as a flame. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and don't get me wrong. Nystrom was a lot better as a flame than Kostopoulos. Like, you know, at night and day. But, you know, for the whole body of their work, Kostopoulos was better. And, you know, if Reinhardt yeah. gets... So I guess comparing it as a, as a Flames fan... Yeah, he's probably right that maybe a guy with a better offensive upside would be more of a Nystrom. Um, but overall, as an NHL player, Kostopoulos, I think, has been around longer, um, played in the NHL more, and, yeah, has better offensive yeah. numbers. Yeah, and either way, like, you're splitting hairs between a guy that has, a, like, 15 to 20 point potential and another guy that has, like, 15 to 20 point potential. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, I can understand, like, it's not like we're disrespecting Reinhardt, it's just that it's hard to be a good point producer at the NHL level, like, it, you know, like, fourth liners get a lot of crap for, oh, they suck, but, you know, like, you, you're going up against the very best players in the world, so, you know, it's hard, and, like, they'd mop the floor with anybody else, it's just... You know, in relation to the star players, they are not as good. Yeah, I, I think that we would probably both agree that um, Reinhardt is probably going to have an equally illustrious career as either Kostopoulos or Nystrom. will probably be around the league for just as long. He'll probably play at the NHL level, um, you know, kind of that top level. Not top six, but a regular NHLer probably just as long as either oh, one yeah. of those Oh, Like, I could see Reinhardt easily being a 10, 12-year NHL veteran without much issue. It, you know, it's just expecting him to be a key contributor on a scoring line is maybe above his pay grade, talent-wise, so... Yeah, and, you know, as we mentioned um, before and we mentioned in this show... Just because they look good at the AHL doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to translate that success to the NHL long term. So I think, yeah, Reinhardt's a perfect bottom six guy, and I'd like to see him stay around the Flames as a bottom six guy. Oh, yeah, don't get me wrong. Like, I like Reinhardt quite a bit, and, like, I'm looking forward to him becoming a good third, fourth line guy for us. It's just, you know, you have to be realistic on expectations. Like, he's not, like, a... Uh, Sven Berchi or whatever so you know and like each forward position is equally important and you know if Reinhardt can be that really good dynamic fourth line guy that can like help turn the game over you know and like like when you're struggling if he can be that energy guy to reignite things so that the other lines can you know, start rolling, then that would be good. And, like, I think he has that in him. It's just, I don't, you know, scoring-wise, I don't think it's there. Yeah, I totally agree with you. All right. Let's wrap up, then. So, this has been our 30th episode of Fireside Chat. We're glad everybody can join us, and we hope that everyone will join us for another 30. Um, why don't we go around the table as usual and let people know how they can find us, and let's start with you, Luke. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Luke1701, L-U-C-1701. Please let us know if someone's listening. We do appreciate uh, when you do. And Matt, where can people find you? At, uh, on Twitter at CagedGreat. And, yeah. And I do uh, live broadcasting on Twitter during the road games. So... Drop a line. Yeah, Matt, you can follow Matt. You can uh, do what I do and follow him while you're watching the game to get some insight into the game. And it, you've actually got quite a passionate little community that seems to follow you and chat with you. Yeah. How many followers are you up to up now? Up to about 45. I think 44 or 45 now. Nice. Slowly building. Oh, my God. You're a cult builder. 
And um, as usual, I, I won't promote mine too much. I'm not too hockey related, but I'm at DG Stevenson. But do make sure you follow the podcast. Um, we are on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash fireside chat. We're on Twitter. We're at fireside podcast. Um, visit our website to read our articles, listen to our show every week. It's firesidechat.ca. And you can subscribe to us through the website. You can subscribe to us through iTunes. And if you do subscribe through iTunes, please leave a five-star review. And you can also subscribe through Stitcher if you're a Stitcher user. So we're everywhere that fine podcasts are available. And uh, please let your friends know about us. Keep listening. Spread the word. We want to make sure that we're getting our word out to as much of the Sea of Red as possible. Anything else for you guys this week? Not really. Just I want to thank all the fans for listening and yeah, interacting with us, sending, send us more feedback and reviews and all that. It helps us to improve our product as yeah, well. Yeah, we're always we're always willing to take feedback. We'll leave the feedback page up on the website. So if you ever have something you want to uh, send us, any thoughts you have, just feel free to fire them our way. Anything for you, Luke? Nope. All right, why don't you take us out? All good. Suck it, Tom. We are the voice of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.